Okay. All right. So, um, John, would you just give us kind of a, a background of like how we even got connected and how, you know, this whole thing started um, all the way back to like 2015, 2016? Um, so I started my career teaching at Veterans Memorial Middle School in Columbus, and um, I know I taught. Is Libby still in VOV? She okay. is, yeah. Very, but um, Libby was in um, one of my choirs towards the end of my time there, but I was there for four years, and it was either my first or second year that was Dr. Folta's first year at CSU. So um, she made herself very available to all of the educators. I remember her being at our GMEA meeting, introducing herself and just saying, hey, I wanna be available to all of you. And I know you all know she's like the most helpful giving person ever. And um, that was my first introduction to her, being herself <laughs> and just making herself, even as one of the new people in the room, um, a resource for all of us that uh, may have also been new to the district. So um, I remember Dr. Folta came and observed one of my classes as I was helping prep for um, LGPE with veterans. I, I, don't, I, I don't know the timeline of all of this, so I'm probably like mixing all of these things up, <laughs> but I accompanied for um, one of the GMEA honor choruses for middle school when um, was the conductor. And I, that's how we really kind of started our friendship. Mm -hmm. um, she <laughs> had some very animated rehearsals with me trying to get me to play Beyond the Sea, which is a jazz piece like a true jazz pianist, which I am not. Um, so, but she was always just a great colleague and friend. And um, when she started with VOV, she told me that um, someday she wanted to start a family and that when she was on maternity leave, she wanted me to be um, well, to step in for her for those few months. And so I did. And uh, right when Lena was born, I conducted for, um, I think, Monday rehearsals for about eight weeks, um, starting you guys on some of your prep for London. And um, Dr. Fulton knew that I was a composer as well. And so she said after one of her concerts, you know, if you're ever writing children's choir music, let me know. And I hadn't been writing any children's choir music, but she kept me in mind and I started writing a little bit more frequently in 2019. And she called me up, I think it was last summer and said, hey, I'm thinking about the possibility of entering VOV into some contests and um, for some festivals. And we would love to have you write a piece for us. And so we started fleshing it out in earnest, I think at the beginning of this year. And it was finished just a few months after that. Yeah, and I, I remember specifically, um, I'd had this text for a while, and um, it just was, it had your name written all over it to, to this is the one that, that needs to happen. And so, so um, talk through the process of um, the very first thing, and I'm not sure if all, anytime a, a piece is commissioned, I'm not sure if the text is sent or if someone says, I'm looking to write a piece that's kind of sounds like, um, so you've written a few pieces now. What, what's the first step to you writing a choral piece? Um, I really want to make sure I identify with the text. Um, so w once I find a text I like, one of the first things I generally try to do is to put it to memory. Um, with this piece, <laughs> when you sent it, it was so long that I was like, I'm not going to memorize this. But thankfully, one of the first things you said is that we can pick and choose what um, lines are, are the most meaningful and would make the most sense to, to put to music. So uh, the first process was me deciding which of those lines I felt connected to me the best, which lines I felt uh, sung the best. Um, and I did, I, I believe, commit those to memory. As at the time, as best I could, as the first step in the process. And then what comes after that? What because we did what we did was we I sent you the text, and then um, we kind of decided, you know, which parts can come out. And I remember specifically talking about I want this piece to be accessible to a variety of different situations. So I didn't want it to be super sacred because there are portions of it 
that are very sacred and and I wanted to keep it secular so we could apply it in multiple places, Mm -hmm. um, which helped us kind of decide which portions of the text that we wanted to keep and which portions we wanted to to take out. Um, So then what did you do once we decided these are the lines we're going to keep? I generally try to stay away from the piano at this point when I'm first starting to write. Um, When I first started composing, I, I wanted to play everything at the piano first and um, but I found with this piece, what helped the most is on my drives into work, I had about a 20 minute drive to and from work each day. And um, in my drives around Dallas, which is where I was living at the time, I would just kind of rehearse these lines in my head and um, try different melodies out and see you know, what popped out at me. With the text that we chose, there was not um, any sense of, of meter really to this poetry. Some poetry, like for instance, the first thing that pops into my mind is hymns that we might know. Amazing Grace, most of us know, um, has a very uh, old poetic form to it where there's syllables that fall in line. Amazing, great, sweet the sound. And something like that can be a lot easier to set to music, especially those of us that have grown up singing hymns like that. Um, That's how I first started writing music, was taking old hymn texts and writing new tunes to them. So this presented a challenge for me because I couldn't just do, um, uh, here's my verse and here's my chorus, and I'll just repeat them and kind of try to make it altered in some sense so it's not boring. So I had to think about um, when I was writing and coming up with the first melodies, like what is a melody that can be applied to different parts of this text that can unify it together in a way that that makes musical sense. So that's kind of what I was doing. I I was trying to figure out a melody that would work in multiple different parts of the text that I could have as a unifying element. And then for all of the other sections, I was thinking about what type of melody would make most sense as the mood kind of shifts throughout the poem. So form, I guess, (laughs) would be my really simple answer for, for what came next. So basically you were looking at the structure of the piece, building the, the, the foundation of the building basically uh, before you actually put the walls up, which would have been the text, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was kind of happening at the same time. We, we had figured out the text that we wanted, but um, sometimes I had to shift a word around here and there or, or change a, a little bit of the sentence structure to, to make it work with the form that I wanted. The, the text really doesn't have a form, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, it's just, here's an idea, here's an idea, or here's my, a little life lesson, here's another life lesson, here's a life lesson. And they're not necessarily connected in a way that um, you might normally find in a musical piece. So I was um, debating, should I write a piece that doesn't feel connected at all? like that? Should I just have a different melody for each different section? Or am I going to, like, how am I going to make this feel like a unified piece? So it kind of went hand in hand with the, with the text and the form. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would imagine, you know, once you're playing with a melody like that or playing with text, you're only thinking about it one voice at a time. And this piece in particular, three voices to write for with different, you know, uh, going different directions and going, you know, doing different things. When did those things start to come in? Or is that later in your compositional process? That probably would have been the next step. <laughs> so um, when I had text and form settled and I was thinking about melodies all at the same time, um, at that point, like once I had sung through some melodic ideas, I spent a lot of time just improvising at the piano. Um, really when you're composing, it's 99% improvisation whether you're at an instrument or whether it's in your head and you just throw out 99% of those ideas and keep the 1% that is like the, the best <laughs> that, that I can create and the best that I can come up with. So when I was at the piano, I would try lots of different things, um, try you know composing those lines of, of counterpoint and seeing how they could line up with the melody that I'd created and seeing what worked and seeing what didn't work. I used my iPhone to record like a lot of voice memos and um, like I can record the line of melody and then try singing a line of counterpoint along with myself. So that was the next step in the process. Mm -hmm. So you weren't taking like music theory per se to to write it. You were really going off of your skills as an aural musician and what would sound great together. 
before yes. you actually went to, and, yes. and I say this because we got a couple of composers in this room. Okay. And I think initially, sometimes uh, composers are taught with, um, you know, using the theory to guide you, but you didn't do that process. You let your ear kind of guide it. Yeah, I, I uh, to be completely honest, I hardly ever use that process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love theory and I did something that I just connected with in college, but in, in my arranging and composing, I have never set out to, I, I don't know, I just don't think that way. <laughs> Sometimes it makes me feel like a dumb composer. I was, I was doing an interview with um, Syracuse University music students recently, and they were asking these complicated questions about music theory. And I was like, guys, I, don't, I just don't write that way. Mm -hmm. um, I have done choir ever since I was in, in junior high actually ever since I was in elementary school, but like regularly as a class since I was in junior high. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm a choir director for my job. <laughs> so I teach junior hires all day and I am a music nerd. So like I will just scour all of this new music on um, like JW on sheet music distributor websites. And so, so I'm choosing the very best things that I think my students will enjoy. And so I think just with all of that exposure, I, know what I like <laughs> and um, and I enjoy coming up with things that, that I think other people will really connect to and enjoy. So yeah, it's just really improvisation for me, not from a theoretical standpoint, but just from a creating joyful music standpoint. Mm -hmm. How do you decide, so I'm gonna go into theory for a second, even though you just said that's what I think. Okay. Um, but at some point you had to decide on a key and a time signature. So how did that come to pass for you? Um, well, the key, it, it would have just been from, well, well, let me start with time signature. So when I was imp improvising all of these melodies, you know, in my car, um, I wasn't thinking about time signature necessarily. I was just like thinking about the meter of different lines that I knew had similar enough structure that I could create a melody line that would have been unifying off of them. So go placidly amid noise and haste, has a sort of um, structure to it. Go placidly amid noise and haste. And then remember peace, may lie in silence is similar enough to where I knew I could create a melody off of those. So um, I took the rhythm of the text, like I just kind of spoke it <laughs> out loud and I would speak it as if I was reading it as a, as a poem or as a, um, a, a liturgy. And from there, I matched that to a melody that made sense. And when I looked at the melody, I realized it was in 4-4. Four four. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how that happened. It was just through improvisation. And then key, uh, I took the melody that I had created, improvised a little bit, and I know voices well enough of the ages that, that y'all are in VOV that I knew what would work the best. Um, I knew what I'm comfortable teaching <laughs> as a as a choir director and then I know there's some notes I don't want to go above generally speaking for um, at least you know 13 to 15 year old girls and as a core of your ensemble I think is around at least it was around middle school age that's kind of just uh, what I was thinking about as I set the range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and we did discuss the voicing too, because at the time we, uh, we were going with the SSA, but what's interesting is this semester, this semester in particular, we've had a shift where a lot of our boys have changed. And so today when I was telling the, the staff right before this, I spent some time looking for spring music and it's all gonna be SAB because it's it's interesting how the choir shifts over time and, and changes. So. Uh, Sorry, guys. Yeah, DJ and Jackson, get ready. AJ, get ready. <laughs> um, very cool. Okay, so you're singing in your car. You've done some things where you sing against yourself and you kind of improv some lines. Um, this is before you've actually put in an accompaniment because one of the things that we had talked about when I was kind of giving you my, my laundry list of, I want to make sure we have this, I want to make sure we have this, et cetera, um, was uh, I needed it to have an accompaniment because we have an incredible pianist and I want to make sure that we had ways to showcase Sam. So at what point did the piano come into play with all of this? Um, well, I remember one of the words you used when you were describing what you wanted to me was, I think, shimmery. <laughs> you wanted a shimmery accompaniment. Um, 
And with that word, I, I wanted to play around a little bit with um, the Lydian mode, a raised fourth, because I feel like that sounds very heavenly. Um, I thought, I think, in fact, the rudder, um, the final movement of the rudder requiem uses Lydian mode. Is that is that raised fourth? So if you're singing up a scale, um, do, re, mi, fa, it would be like raising fa to fi. Mm -hmm. And it creates this new mood. And so I have that in the piano introduction. Um, and then it happens several other times throughout the piece. So that's kind of was my first initial idea for the accompaniment, um, like featuring Lydian sometimes. And um, then the other, I think the second thing that came was in the middle where there's these descending 16th notes um, that are building up to the big climax. Um, I should have had the score in front of me. It's, a, to, it's still a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the next thing that came, and I just like that idea of kind of slowly building up and having um, just uh, faster rhythms like move towards this big climax. It's still a beautiful world. And then everything else, um, I, I think I had written all the parts out first, and I just matched what the voices were doing to, to what I thought would be a really good support um, for the accompaniment. Those are the only two specific sections that, that I remember thinking like what I was trying to accomplish <laughs> with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the piano accompaniment is purely supporting the voices. Like I don't want it to be the main thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there were aspects of this accompaniment that since I know Sam and since he's a far better pianist than I am, <laughs> there were some things that, that I added to that I, I may have shied away from in a different accompaniment. Even if it's still the main role is just to support you as singers, Sam is doing some, uh, maybe some things that might be a little bit more difficult than what I would normally put in an accompaniment. Mm -hmm. And side note, you and Sam went to the same college for undergrad. Yes. Yep. Well, we actually we actually went to the same junior high. Believe it or not, but we weren't the same. We're not the same age yet. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Beard, Mr. Brown. He's completely let himself go. That's crazy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm such a distraction. <laughs> I didn't, I don't think I knew Sam at the time when we were in junior high, but like I could, I could pull out my junior high yearbook and he would be in there. Um, I'm going to need you to do that for me. <laughs> I'm going to need that picture of Sam Brown, please. I'll, I'll text This him. goes both ways, John. Be careful. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll text it to you later, and then you can share with the choir if you... Oh, perfect. I'm going to put it on our poster. That's going to be our concert poster, Emily Moore. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sam. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you bring up a good point about accompanists, because we, we talked about this, and when I was a public school teacher, um... I would not say that the accompanists that I had were anywhere near the level that Sam plays. And as a choir director, um, there may have been times certain pieces, like I'm thinking of like the music of living from like Dan Forrest and how that would have, I would have maybe shied away from that if I mm -hmm. couldn't find someone that could play it. Um, but I think the good thing about the accompaniment here is it does showcase things, but it's still very accessible uh, to a wide variety of pianists that would be able to play it within a public school setting. Because of course, the bigger goal here, friends, is yes, it's being commissioned for Voices of the Valley, but also that John can publish this and it can be accessible to the rest of the, the choirs in the world for anyone to use. Um, so that of course is the goal. Um, so, okay, so the piano part comes after you've done all the initial writing of all the voice parts, is that correct? In this instance, it did. That's not always the case necessarily, but yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so when you were writing the um, the actual vocal parts, were you putting the text in at the same time as you were writing the notes down? No. Um, I In the program that I used to enter this in my computer, um, I know that when I'm first entering notes in that I will make changes later on, or I'll at least format it differently. And so if I put text in at the same time, it would just be creating a lot of work. So text is normally just in, when I'm creating the score that I sent to you is like the last thing that I do. Mm -hmm. So how long at this point had you been working on the piece? Until I sent it to you? 
No, well, at, until like the writing of the piano part, because the first draft I got did have text in it. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when I sent you a first draft, in my mind, that's like, okay, I, I want to create something that looks like it's finished. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So um, by the time I sent you the first draft, yes, it, it had text, it had piano part, it, it was a finished document if you chose to accept it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that probably was about a month and a half, mm -hmm. I think, from when I first earnestly started working on it, thinking through that text. And is that a pretty common timeline for you or? For, I do tend to write fairly quickly. Um, and, and I think a lot of people would say that that is quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so most pieces I, I tr am usually finished in about a month's time, I would say. Um, but in between pieces, like it, it takes me a long time to, to get to the point where I'm actually um, writing a piece and, and like actually thinking about it and it's it's consuming my creative process at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got the first draft and the first thing that I did as a director was play and sing through all of the parts individually and then I also put them together, playing them in parts, doing something similar to what John did where I was singing, like I would play the soprano line and sing the alto line and hear how all those things fit. We looked at the text or I looked at the text a little bit more. I also sent it to Sam to look at the piano part to see, you know, if there was anything. Cause I, as a choir director, I mean, I can look at the piano part, but he's the one who's got to put his hands on it and tell me if there's anything that's wonky or feels strange or a chord that needs to be changed. Um, and we came back, I think we had a, a pretty good list of things that we gave to you initially um, of tweaking. I love the first product. The first product was like, yes, John gets it. And that to me is the best feeling as a director. So this is our second commissioned piece. And that first draft that you get, you're like, I want to make sure, I hope he knows our vision and you nailed it. Like it was so pretty. The accompaniment was so nice. Um, I think we ended up, this is when we kind of took out some more of that sacred text and made it more secular. I think mm -hmm. this was the round that we did that. Um, yeah. And I don't remember too many of the other things that we did. Um, I think it was shifting around some stuff in the piano to be more helpful for the singers. Um, and then, because at this point, by this point, I was planning for COVID. So we initially, when we first started talking about a commissioned piece, we weren't, COVID hadn't happened yet. And so at this point, I knew that we were going to have to have something that would be able to assist for a virtual um, uh, world premiere of this. So mm -hmm. we kind of had shifted, I think, our, the way we were going to do it at that point. Um, so we, you and I, was it, I don't know if Sam was in this meeting, if the, it was in the first one, but we yeah. met on Zoom and I kind of talked through some of the things I was thinking, or we either met on the phone and we, I just kind of talked through some of those things and you said, okay, well, let me go back, let me take this back and let me look at these things and see what you, you think. And, you know, it was, it's interesting as a director to take those back because you, you very much as a director, or at least I did, I want a piece from John Reed. So I don't want it to be the Michelle Fulta piece. <laughs> I want it to be the John Reed piece. And so I tried to give more macro, this is the picture I'm going for. And then John went in and actually put that into the music to, to what it was looking, what we were looking for. So then the second draft came and it was pretty quick, John. It was like, what, a week and a half maybe later? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it wasn't long after that. And so uh, then Sam and I looked at it again. And I think the only cha thing we changed on the second one was taking out the, the extension of the coda. Yep. Um, and that was the only thing that, you know, that was different is just changing that ending around. Mm -hmm. And then I think within a week, you fixed that. And then you were like, here's the final draft. And we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> and that was it. And the cool thing, or one of the things that was interesting is when you actually sent that final draft, because I knew that we were using my choral coach at that point, you sent it to me in a file that could easily be uploaded 
into that program in addition to sending me a PDF of it that could be distributed to the children. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really cool to be able to, to input all of that um, right into that program. And it was the very first piece that I threw into that program for use uh, during this time. So can you talk us through um, how you approached each one of those drafts with the corrections and what was your process after that? Yeah, uh, it, my biggest, <laughs> it, it, I almost said the word struggle and that's not, it wasn't a struggle. Um, my biggest thought process that I was going through was the same thing that you just mentioned. I was like, I want it to be my piece. <laughs> and some of that is just like pure composer, you know, pride. <laughs> like it's mine. <laughs> don't touch my piece. But it's, um, this text is something that I, I don't, I'm sure you've told your choir, but this is like a family history behind this for you. And it was a meaningful text um, for Dr. Folta and, you know, many, many others. I started researching this text and the first thing I found was, you know, all of these Facebook posts from people saying like, you know, this has, um, this was in our home, you know, all during my childhood. And this, this was our parents' wish for us. And, and we, this was like advice um, that was always talked about in our household. So it was very special text for many people. So it's not something that I <laughs> can clutch as my own because, you know, music is something that is shared and it is, uh, there's the, the communal, the community aspect of music is the most special thing about it, especially being in a choir. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to have, you know, a, a hands off, hands on approach. Um, and so, I took your comments and I think I was still able to very much keep it my own piece and my own style. Um, my, my thought for, from that first draft, whenever you sent me some ideas was, was mostly that the piece was a little bit too easy. <laughs> um, I know you wanted to have, I, I had a lot more unison than is currently in the piece. Oh, that's right. I do remember that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of it was adding more lines of counterpoint um, for all three parts to sing or um, having, you know, maybe soprano twos and altos do a unison section while soprano ones take a little bit of a descant. And so it was just adding that. And once you have the bare bones of a piece, once you have an accompaniment, once you have the melody line, adding other lines of counterpoint is something that is, is really fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's not something that I think is hard. It's something that I really enjoy. Um, so it was just a little bit more improv and playing around with those different lines. And I, that's, I think, why it didn't take too long, because it was actually a, a pretty fun process revisiting the piece. Um, I don't think it's a very common thing to do, to have multiple drafts back and forth between a conductor and a composer, but we're friends, and it was a fun thing to work on. And by the time we got done, and I looked at the final product, I was like, well, it's a better piece <laughs> than that first draft. And that was thanks to all of your insightful comments and. Um, both of us, you know, wanting this to be the best experience that, that we could provide for, for these singers and for your organization. Right. Yeah, I remember um, when we did our, our other commission piece, the How Can I Keep From Singing, um, it was similar with us where we were, we were picking at stuff, but it was longer. It was a longer process, I remember. Um, and, um, but the, the turnaround, you very much got everything that we were, anything that Sam would say or I would say, um, you understood and translated it. And I wonder if that's because we know each other on a personal level. If I were to, you know, commission a piece from a composer and I knew Mark too. So Mark and I worked together in, in Austin. Um, and so I, in my opinion, that's my preference is to work with people I know. Yeah. So um, all you composers out there, you may be next <laughs> when I'm like, I need a piece for <laughs> this. Um, it's always easier to do a creative project, I think, with someone you know and respect and um, because it really does show in the final product. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was a really cool process and really fun to watch. Um, so for this is shifting off of the actual piece for a moment, just from a composer. Can you give us kind of your, a rundown of your composer CV at this point? You know, some of the things that you've done and published and that are outside of this work. Yeah. Um, I, I started writing when I was a senior in high school. Um, my parents worked for a Christian music public, a very small publisher here in Greenville where I grew up and where I just moved back to. And, um, 
the husband and wife team that ran that organization were the composer and arranger team. And so they kind of took me under their wing and mentored me throughout college. And I published probably eight to 10 different adult choral anthems for church that were very easy and fit into a very specific style that that publishing house used. But it was 2016 where I started uh, writing outside of that. Um, in 2012, I um, won uh, my, uh, my first composition award, which kind of made me realize I could publish outside of that very small um, niche publishing house that I, that I had worked with. And that award was the John S. Beck Foundation Award, which was organized by Beckenhorst Press. Um, Dan Forrest was a teacher of mine at the time. He was, I, I was in a choral composition class with him at my college. And the piece that won that award was my capstone project for his class. And it was a piece that once we actually heard it performed on our college composition recital, we realized was not a good piece. <laughs> like it just didn't, uh, it wasn't cohesive. There were lots of random ideas that showed growth as a composer, <laughs> but the overall piece was just, let's have this idea for the guys and this idea for the girls. This one is really hard. This one's super easy, but they'll go great one right after another. And they didn't. But um, so the piece was rejected by this publishing house, but then they chose it to win an unpublished composition award. And so it showed me that I, I really can do this. <laughs> like someone believes in me. And even though they know that I still have like a lot of growth that needs to happen, I can publish with them. So in 2016, I published my first piece with that publishing house, Beckenhorst. Um, I published two pieces with them this year. Um, I've just started writing for schools and um, colleges and more difficult music, um, but basically outside of that church music realm that I grew up in. Um, I had a piece premiered by a Kansas City choir last year, which was my first um, big, it was actually really my first performance that, that I got to travel to that was not inside a church. Uh, I won the Indianapolis Christmas Carol, Indianapolis Symphonic Choir's Christmas Carol Commission last year and got to travel to see them. Um, this year I won a, a contest at Syracuse University, the Greg Smith Choral Composition Contest. Um, I've started publishing with Briley and Carl Fisher Music as my concert publisher um, for school, high school and middle school works. Several pieces have been delayed because of COVID, but I'm slated to continue publishing with them through the next year. And then um, Beck and Horse Press has become my main church music publisher. Mm -hmm. And I've also just launched one of their two inaugural pieces for their concert series. And um, I'm really thrilled about that. That was a very random mishmash. But basically, uh, I started writing in earnest in 2019 at the beginning of the year, even though I had kind of seldomly written since then. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen a lot of performances and I've just had a lot of joy filled experiences from composition since then. Wow. And this is one of them. Wow, so. that's so cool. Yeah. I so what is your are there who are your composer muses, if you will? Like who are who are the composers? I had no idea that you studied with Dan Forrest. I'm a big Dan Forrest fan. Um, but uh, you know, what who are some of the people that that you kind of feel like, oh, I like that song. I, Cause I feel like we do that with ed as educators too. Like, oh, I yeah. like how this person taught this or this person taught this. So well, who is that for you in composition? Um, I, I have, th there's some composers that I love but I don't write anything like them. <laughs> um, probably th the one that I most relate to is Dan because he is, he, he was my teacher. And honestly, when I was in high school, choir, which is where I first started falling in love with choir. I, I was attending a small Christian school here in Greenville, and um, we did a lot of Dan's church pieces. And he was a graduate of the school that I, that I was attending. My high school was housed on the campus of the university that, that he graduated from. Yeah. So he was kind of just worshipped at the school. And I thought it was so cool that this guy, who basically grew up just like me, um, could become this big deal in the choral music world. And so I just like devoured his music. Um, the, my, the college here premiered a lot of his pieces. One of his most famous pieces, Good Night Dear Heart, was premiered when I was, I think, a senior in high school. And there's this beautiful story behind it. And I was there at the premiere. And things like that kept happening where I would hear his music and be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. So um, 
now he is my editor at Beck and Horse Press, and he's a friend here in Greenville. I was just over at his house <laughs> a few weeks ago, went to church with his family a few weeks ago, and um, I wish, like sometimes I feel like he's too much of an inspiration for me, but you also can't go back to all of these amazing experiences in your life and say, well, I shouldn't have listened to so much Dan Forrest. <laughs> like you put out what you take in. And um, I think he is probably my biggest inspiration for, for choral music. Um, I love adding random dissonances into my music and I have Morton Lardson to thank for that because he gave composers freedom to just add in random seconds and um, sevenths sometimes. <laughs> Uh, in, in music where as long as you're approaching them in, in a place that makes sense in each individual voice, you can kind of throw in there and you don't have to have a reason for it. And especially in the concert music I've written recently, uh, it's pretty dissonant um, while still maintaining that very tonal atmosphere. And I have Lauritsen to thank for that. One of my favorite composers that's not choral music is Stephen Sondheim, the Broadway composer. I adore him and I wish that I could write music like like he does and write lyrics like he does. He's, he's this incredible musical genius. But I listen to Sondheim um, Broadway shows like all the time. So maybe someday he'll start to creep in <laughs> and things that I'm writing. Those are three right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So um, outside of, I would say, Broadway and classical realm, is there anyone, like what kind of pop music do you listen to? Uh, what kind of genres do you like outside of that? I, I have students ask me this question all the time. And just to be completely honest, I probably don't listen to as much music as I should. Um, I, I obviously love music. I mean, it's everything that I do. I'm in a community choir here in Greenville. I teach choir all day. I write choir music. So sometimes I just need a break. <laughs> but um, some of my favorite artists, uh, I love Sufjan Stevens. <laughs> Some of you probably have no idea who that is. He's an alternative uh, artist, and he does a, he does a lot of electronic style music. His newest album he just released this past month, and it was more of an electronic inspired album. But he also has beautiful acoustic based albums with just hints of little electronic um, sounds and music thrown in, and I love that. Um, I grew up actually listening to bluegrass music and gospel music. Um, so Southern gospel music, I should clarify. My uncles had a bluegrass band. My great uncles had a bluegrass band when they were teenagers. They had their own radio show. And so every, every family reunion on my mom's side, I would go hear my uncles play the banjo and mandolin and guitar. And um, sometimes I, I like go back to that style of music and listen to it. Um, and when I want to do that, I love the Avert Brothers who are like kind of a folk rock band. And um, I think they're great. <laughs> we have some people that agree, awesome. <laughs> I think they're just fantastic musicians. Um, they have a lot of artistry in their, in their music and in their lyrics. And they're actually the only band that I've ever seen live in concert. So. I have a little bit of connection with them. And then the last one I'll say, these are totally not related at all. So I, I guess my tastes are kind of eclectic. I fell in love with John Mayer in high school and I still- We like, all did. <laughs> true. <laughs> but um, there are specific songs that I, like, I have very much related to, like even still as an adult. Um, so I often like will listen to John Mayer on drives, so. I love his- um his take on Tom Petty's Free Fallen, the live version. Uh, oh man, that album. That, that oh whole my album. God, that album is incredible. I, would, I mean, I would love to see him live because he, he's one of those musicians that, like there's some people, you hear them live or you see recordings and you're like, I don't know if they can sing. <laughs> like they are a great songwriter and they're a great producer. And, but you know, they are very much helped by the recording studio. Mm -hmm. But he's yeah. one that, is just, I mean, he's incredible. And like hearing him improv, he does a lot of blues music. He's heavily influenced by yeah. blues. Oh he's yeah. Like, the guitar is just insane. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Um, I want to give our staff and our, our uh, singers an opportunity to ask any questions that they have about the composition process or how do you get in with a publisher? Um, I have to brag about one of my singers. Um, now Jackson, make sure I get this right when I say this. And Sam, too. So Jackson was honorable mention in the NAFME um, Young Artist 
composition competition. Is that right, Jackson? Um, it was uh, the electronic music composition contest and the regular composition contest. And y'all, I don't know if you listen. I put it on Facebook, the one that he, some, one of the ones he submitted. It was awesome. So you're talking about electronic music and, and some of that. Um, and I, I wonder if the process is similar when you're writing like electronic music versus classical choral music. Jackson, is that a similar process that you go through too? In some ways. Uh huh. Um, I'm actually not very proud of the electronic one that I submitted, but because I wrote it like one day before submitting it and that was dumb. Well, we're all proud of it and it sounded great. I was super excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask uh, Mr. Reed about his compositional uh, process or anything that they're thinking of? Go ahead, Sierra. I was just going to ask, do you experience um, writer's block, composer's block? And how do you deal with that if you do? Yeah, I mean, all the time. I, I, I think I said earlier, like once I start writing a piece, it happens quickly. But then there's, you know, weeks, months in between where like, I feel like nothing is happening in my brain. <laughs> um, for me, I'm just so greatly inspired by poetry and text. And I'm not thinking of ideas apart from poetry and text. So um, sometimes I feel like writer's block for me comes from just, I feel that every other composer has set every great piece of poetry to music already. And what more do I have to offer the world? <laughs> um, sometimes that, that might be true, but other times I, I wrote a piece last year, I Carry Your Heart With Me, which has been set by Eric Whitaker. And there's a uh, well-known setting, and I can't remember the dude's name, but published by Walton Music. Um, but I came up with the ideas and I was like, I think this is worthy to like to offer the world. Like this is a different take on it. And like, I just kind of had to talk myself into that. Like my voice should be valued, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so sometimes that's it. Just telling myself, I do have something to offer the world. And uh, you know, my perspective is, is unique. Um, so sometimes it's just giving yourself a pep talk and other times it's just waiting. During COVID, the first several months, I, I mean, I wrote Desiderata and the very, I was finishing it up in the very beginning of COVID, but um, I kept feeling like I, I needed to be inspired by being by myself all the time. I was living by myself during the first part of the quarantine in Dallas and like nothing was coming to me, but I was really um, helped by talking to a few other composers and just saying, are, are you feeling this way? And many of them were. So um, I think it's okay to wait for the muse or the inspiration to happen. But um, for me, if I, if I really feel like I want to be writing, it's just, you know, trying to find poetry and texts that inspire me or even looking for new, uh, you know, new sources that, that I can look to for text. So you have to, to follow up with that and tell us what are what were the other composers saying about uh, how they were feeling during COVID and how you stay inspired or get re-inspired? Well, um, so this discussion happened at a workshop I was in this summer. It was in July, right after I moved to Greenville. It was about 12 of us. And it was a workshop put on by the John S. Beck Foundation that I mentioned earlier that kind of you know gave me the kick in the pants that I needed <laughs> to get started writing. Um, but it was Dan Forrest that actually said, the only, he's only written one piece in COVID and it was his uh, Shalom, which was a piece he just um, put out with his church music publisher, Beckenhorst. Um, and he didn't really have, I mean, advice. Like he was just saying basically that it's okay. Like it's okay to let yourself not write. Um, you, he might feel more pressure just because there, there might be people waiting for music from him. But for me, like, I mean, I, I don't have any name recognition built up at this point. So I don't feel like there's no publishers asking me for music. Um, so I, I'm, I'm okay to be a little bit content. Um, but yeah, the discussion really wasn't, um, let's help each other out. It was just kind of admitting to each other that we all felt the same way. So, but even that's important, you know, especially like now, I mean, I was just listening to a podcast today that was talking about how 
rates of, you know, depression and, you know, suicidal ideation and all of these things are going up for COVID because we feel isolated, but we are literally all <laughs> in, in this together. And, you know, it impacts different ones of us in different ways and it impacts some in greater ways than others. But I think talking to each other and admitting how you're feeling to other people is the most important thing that we can do. Um, so that would be my biggest advice, just it's okay. And, um, but yeah, get some composer friends and, you know, commiserate with each other. And, and that might be a source of inspiration in the end. It's interesting to hear how COVID has affected so many different um, avenues and, and in different ways, but some ways that are similar. Um, you know, looking at arts organizations and how many of them have had to go out of business or postpone their seasons. And we were very fortunate that we had resources to continue um, and to, to be able to do a world premiere and be creative um, to create this, you know, experience for, for our students. Um, I will tell you that you will be traveling to Columbus to see this in Legacy Hall someday. <laughs> As soon as we're back in there, um, and we, I mean, literally, Sam can tell you that I said that on Monday night. I cannot wait to hear this in this hall. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so what a beautiful sound it will be in that space. Um, and, uh, but it's interesting to kind of hear that take of, of writer's block. And, and I'm sure, I mean, those of you, I mean, Josh is working on composition and, of course, Jackson, we were just talking to you about yours. We have a couple of other people that, that also compose that I know of. Um, and that's very much a real thing is I need to create and I need to create now. And that's kind of hard to, to do in a time like this. Yeah. The, the other thing I will say is when I first started writing like in earnest again in 2019, I just, I, I did force myself to sit down and, and put ideas down on paper. Mm -hmm which doesn't work for some people. And I always thought it didn't work for me, but it worked really well for about three months. Um, almost every piece that I've had published in, well, in the past year, which has been about six to eight pieces was written in those three months. Um, just because I was like, I, I started getting on a roll. And again, sometimes that happens, but the, the reason I got on a roll and of feeling creative was because I, I made myself sit down and do it. So sometimes I think that's okay. Even if it's like, if sitting down in front of Finale or Sibelius or whatever you use, if that's intimidating, then just sit down and improvise on the piano or whatever your instrument is, or even just singing in the car. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sometimes it's okay to like, let's do this. Mm -hmm. that doesn't always work. Before I ask another question, does anyone have uh, any more questions they'd like to ask Mr. Reed about composing or about Go ahead, Mr. Thar. So um, you had just mentioned like some of the different uh, softwares. Like, what is your preferred software when it comes to putting something like on paper? Uh, Finale is all I've ever used, so that is preferred. <laughs> uh, I have a friend. I, I was trying to think of the name of it. There is a new one that a good friend of mine. Um, just started using and I cannot think of it for the life of me and some of you may know that are like currently in music school um man I wish I could think of that anyways th there's a third one that uh, some people have uh said great things about and even some bloggers have have written about and saying they transcribe music all day for a living you wouldn't know their name but they're literally you know in music software all day and they said it's cutting down a lot of uh, time for them to use this. I'll, I'll find it. I'll text Dr. Volta and she can let you know. So, yeah, oh, I, it's, it's Dorico. Dorico is the name of it. Okay. Jackson just said, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I missed that. Um, yes, Dorico. You could check it out. But I, I use Finale. By now, all of like the, the keyboard shortcuts are so ingrained in my brain that I have no desire to switch to anything else, even if someone, you know, tells me it's going to be better. You're showing your age, John. Yeah, that's <laughs> Got some gray hair coming in back You're here. You're going to be shouting for kids to get off your lawn next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and were you, when you were putting that in, were you using a keyboard to input it, or were you manually doing it? Um, I, I, use, I use a keyboard. Like, I, Sorry, well, I use a musical keyboard. <laughs> like, I use my electric piano, and then I use the computer keyboard 
So the way it works, if you've never used music software before, is let's say I wanted to input a quarter note on middle C. So I press middle C on my piano, and then I push five on my keyboard, and that puts in a middle C quarter note. <laughs> so um, basically, I've gotten to the point where I'm really kind of fast moving my fingers around on my numeric keypad while I'm playing. And I can, I can enter pretty quickly at this point, but it takes a while to get there. Yeah. If I'm away from my um, piano, like um, I was traveling to see my parents uh, about a month ago and I didn't take my piano with me, but uh, I was doing some editing in a score. And in that case, I can just do some like clicking and, and I can enter it without my, my piano, but that's my preferred method because it's fastest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What skills do you think one needs to have to be a good composer? Um, <laughs> most people would say theory, but like I said, I don't necessarily um, think that's true. I, I have never been asked this question before, so I'm trying to think it through. I think that the biggest thing is that y you need to be a good listener. Um, I mentioned earlier, you will only like put out what has been put in. <laughs> so um, if you want to write really good electronic music, then I, I, I would be a horrible electronic music composer because I do not listen to that style of music. Or I would be, I would be, really be a horrible like songwriter for pop music because um, I have like a few artists that I listen to, but that's really not what I do. But I teach choral music and I sing choral music and um, that's my passion. And so I listen to tons of it and I study tons of it. And um, I think through that, I'm able to have a creative output based on what I've listened to. So I think that's really important. Um, just over the past two years, I've been able to do a, a lot of things like this that we're doing now, talking with actual people who sing my music. Um, and as I've met with other composers over the last few years, I've, I've realized like half of what they do and even half of what they're getting paid for in composing is to go actually hold clinics with people. It's not necessarily to write music. You know, they're they're making maybe even like up to a fourth of their salary um, being a good teacher. <laughs> and so I think if composing is something that you want to make money off of, then you need to be really comfortable um, interacting with others, which is, it seems so random <laughs> because a lot of times I think we think of the, co the composer hermit, you know, hold up in his home, like with a score and a pencil and, you know, furiously writing down music, never talking to anyone, but in the modern, world <laughs> like what most composers are doing is they're writing for churches and they're writing for schools and community choirs that a lot of times want to meet you so that's been something that's been really fun and and honestly a skill that that i've had to like think through and and, and build because i'm not always the, the best at like talking about my own work um it's not always something that's super comfortable but that's a skill that i've i've tried to build um so listening <laughs> being with people uh, I, I think you probably need to be really, really good at one instrument, at least. Um, a, a lot of people want to just play piano by ear, and that's how they want to learn. And they, own, they get to a certain point, and it's really hard for them to, to get any farther in that instrument or in composing or anything else. So um, I, I do not think I would be writing music had I not been very diligent with my lessons on my instrument, which is the piano. I uh, write choral music, but I have had maybe three semesters of voice lessons in my life. That was not my main instrument. I could have focused to that, but I really just wanted to stick with my one instrument that I had done since I was in first grade, and that was piano. So even though I don't necessarily think theoretically, I know that I would not be able to have the output that I have had I not had all of that training in theory and in piano. So um, that's probably the most important thing I could say, save it for last. And then one thing that, that I think is interesting, when we talk about a commissioned work, um, which I've explained to, to our singers, is Voices of the Valley basically bought this work from you for voices to sing, um, and then for it to be 
publish. So can you talk a little bit about the business end of how a commissioned piece works? If you become, and this is really for, for my choir nerds out there that want to be choir teachers, and maybe you get to a place where you're going to go perform at GMEA, you're going to perform at ACDA or AMEA, and you want to have a, a special piece to, to show that, what's the process on the business side for doing that? From a conductor's standpoint or from a composer's standpoint? From your standpoint. I know what mine is. I got to write the check. <laughs> well, um, well, that, that first, the first step is the contact, which, which will initiate with a choir director. So um, right now, and I'm just being very honest, and Dr. Fulton knows this, and she's probably told you, <laughs> this is my first paid commission. Um, I have had commissions before. I have one in the works right now that is for a relative of mine <laughs> and he works for uh, he's the choir director at a very large college in florida and they commissioned a piece um that i did not charge them for <laughs> i probably should have but i didn't uh there's a piece that i wrote for choir directors in texas that i worked for who were dear friends and uh, the payment that i requested was to go to the premiere um, trip with them in london in just a few months, which of course is not happening. So um, I've done commissions before, but this is the first one that I actually got to go through this process. So um, Dr. Fulta contacted me um, because she knew me, but I think most times you're contacting a conductor or a composer that you just really like their work and you've done their pieces before, you know that what they're gonna give you is quality. Um, so for me as a new composer, I have a website that has uh, my SoundCloud linked up to it where people can listen to all of my works I try to uh, advertise myself in not non-assertive ways on social media. Some people will always be angry with you if you try to promote yourself on Facebook, but for me, that's that's literally the only thing I can do right now. Because um, I have music being published now during COVID, and sometimes I just have to do that. So uh, I'm trying to build that base where people will know that John Reed will produce quality music and will contact me. Um, but right now it's mostly friends, word of mouth, things like that. But um, I get some sort of a contact um, from someone and they ask me about, um, a lot of times they'll ask me about my fees first. So it's important to have kind of what you wanna charge, which kind of depends on where you are in your compositional field. Um, for Dr. Fulta, she gave me a price and I, she said, well, this is what we paid Mark Patterson, who is this well-known, dude who, who did your arrangement of how can I keep from singing? And I literally, I think my words were, I know my worth and it's not that. <laughs> so I actually charge less than that initial. Um, Well-known composers uh, that, well, Dan Forrest, for instance, uh, gave his commission fee and he started at $5,000. So <laughs> most people are not there. I am like well below that. So, uh, but you have to know what your fee is and it kind of depends on what you think your worth is and what your output is at that point. Um, so after you kind of discuss fees, like you wanna make sure that the text is something that resonates with you. Um, I got a commission request last month and someone said, we're having a virtual concert in October. This was September. We're having a virtual concert in October and one of my high school students wrote this poem and we think it's really great and we want you to write a piece. <laughs> Well, the timeline didn't work. The poem did not work. Um, it, it was it was fine, but it was not something that that sung to me, especially for me to be inspired to write something in less than a month. So there's lots of things to flesh out before you say yes to a composition. I think it's really important that you you are accepting only commissions that you know are publishable that will work not just for that one choir but for choirs at large and that you know that you can create something that you don't mind putting your name on. Um, I could have written that piece for that choir, but it wouldn't have been something that I wanted Jonathan Reed beside, because <laughs> it just wasn't enough time. I didn't relate to the text at all. So um, once you have all of those things in place, the fee, a text that you actually like <laughs> and that you know will work, um, and a, a person who seems easily able to work with you, um, then you can start the process. I have a contract that I just, it's a form contract and I can just change dates here and there. Um, for me, I usually want six months at least. Um, if I'm really confident on the piece, 
um, that, that, that I know I can have a good idea, then sometimes it'll be less. But six months is great because you can set it aside for a while, really ruminate on that text, memorize it, and um, get ideas in place. I do, I, I normally would not do a draft. That's not something that's in my um, process because normally for conductors that I do not know, I do not want to have a back and forth with them. Um, I, it, I do want it to be my piece and I wanna say, here you go, <laughs> here's the final draft. Um, and, and that's fine because you know it's different if you have a relationship with the conductor. Um, so I have a down payment that I usually do that once we agree upon the contract, then they Venmo me or PayPal me a down payment, which is about a fourth of my final commission fee. And then when I have sent them my draft um, or the final copies, then I just request the rest of that fee to be given to me. So that's kind of the process. It's, it's really a lot of stuff at the very beginning just making sure that it's something that you really feel like you can accept. And then just a little bit of business at the end. Yeah. So I think, I think that the tendency for new composers might be um, based on my conversations with fellow friends of mine to accept everything that comes at you just so you can make money. But you know, most new composers are not like they have a job that's outside of composing. Like I, I make my living not as a composer, but as a choir director. So I, right now and being pretty picky with commissions because you know that's my name and you know our names are important to us well and it seems like longevity wise too you wouldn't want to come back in 30 years and have a piece floating around out there that you're like oh my god you know well i i mean i already have pieces like that <laughs> like i when i was writing in as a freshman in college for this small niche organization like i can go back and listen to some of those pieces and you know it's you could be embarrassed. I could be embarrassed by it, but that's, that's not how I feel. Like it's part of my journey. Um, but at this point, like I know enough about what I want the trajectory of my journey to be, to be able to make a little bit wiser decisions about what pieces I write. So I think we're always going to have things that we can look back on as artists and say, you know, I'm okay. Like I've come, I've, I'm at peace with the fact that this is out there in the world, but I'm not going to like promote it <laughs> to people. Right. Most of this a memory on my Facebook page. Um, <laughs> Let it stay in the memory. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, are there any other questions that you have for John that you uh, want to pick his brain about? Uh, so those of you, he was talking about his bio uh, at the beginning and about, you know, where he taught. Olivia is now the choir director where John was the choir director back in the day. So the legacy still stands. <laughs> um, so um, John, I'm so thankful for you and thankful for your friendship and your professionalism. And thank you for taking time to talk with us and kind of share your creative process and, um, and how you go about doing these things. I know that uh, it's been very valuable for all of us to, to see that. And actually, he will be doing at the beginning of our virtual choir premiere of this piece, um, he will have a section at the beginning that kind of talks of an abbreviated version of, of our conversation tonight and kind of talks about that process. Um, and then at the end of it, John, I don't know if I told you this, but at the end, after the uh, at the uh, after your thing, Nick will kind of talk about how he put it all together. And so we'll kind of have this this whole project for everyone to kind of see and and play with. And our students start recording on Monday, so um, I'm hoping Nick sends me that track tonight so I can upload it to their Google Drive. Um, but we start recording individuals on Monday. Okay. Uh, for that. So if that's news to you, make sure you're practicing your desiderata because you may be on the list for next week. <laughs> um, so we're so thankful for you, John. Before you leave, I'd like to take a screenshot if that's okay. And this would be yeah. for social media. So fix your face and do oh, yeah. all those things. And would you make sure your cameras are on so I can take a good picture, a good screenshot of everybody? So Carly, can we see you in Genesis and get where you can be in the camera? And Her Sam, his and his hair. <laughs> Sam's going on a hike somewhere. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yeah, Genesis, we're waiting yeah, for you. Let's have Jack in the picture instead of Sam. Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, get rid of that. Carly, okay, Genesis, were you able to? I'll give you a one-two. 
DJ looks like he's got a halo there, like an angel. You look like an angel, DJ. Oh, look at Jack. So I'm, I'm trying to find some. <laughs> okay, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Genesis, you tell me if we can, or if, if not, that's okay too. I'm sorry, I don't think I can at this moment. That's okay. All right, on three, everyone give me a big smile. One, two, three. So precious. Y'all, uh, give a, go ahead and unmute your mic and let's give a, a round of applause to Mr. Reed for coming. Yeah. Woo. 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 I can't wait to welcome you back to Columbus for a live premiere someday. Uh, yeah. And I hope it's sooner than later for sure. So thank you so much, John. I so appreciate it all. Um, friends, thank you all for joining us tonight. I'll see you Monday at rehearsal in the parking garage. And uh, so good to see all of you as well. So staff, you'll stick around, please, because we got a little meeting. And the rest of you, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye, y'all. Thanks.